benefit from the education these institutions made available. Why did we need specifically women's colleges, you might ask? The answer is very simple, because for hundreds of years in American life, colleges did not accept women. Harvard, the oldest college in the United States, was founded in 1636, but did not accept women until 1972. The same applies to virtually all the other Ivy League schools, Princeton, Yale, Brown, Dartmouth, et cetera. Some large Midwestern state universities did open their doors to women after the Civil War, but it was not until the late 1960s that the oldest and most highly regarded American colleges and universities, including Catholic ones like Georgetown, Notre Dame, and Holy Cross, changed their policies to admit women. There were lots of reasons for this exclusion. The idea that women had no need for higher education. The fact that virtually all early American colleges were established to train students for the ministry, law, or politics, vocations from which women were excluded. The reality that most American families did not have the money to educate daughters whose lives would be restricted to home and family. There were even ridiculous fears that women could not withstand the rigors of higher education alongside men. My favorite story here involves a prominent Boston doctor named Edward Clark, who in 1873 wrote a very famous book entitled Sex in Education. In this book, he suggested that higher education for women was literally a danger to the human race. Women risked weakening themselves physically, emotionally, and mentally if they tried to compete intellectually with men in the same classrooms. Women who engaged in sustained vigorous mental activity, studying in a boy's way, he called it, risked atrophy of the uterus and ovaries, masculinization, sterility, insanity, and even death. I guess in those days that was called following the science. So my point, so my point is that for a very long time in American life, if a woman dared to seek higher education, she had very few choices open to her. If a woman wanted to attend college, single sex education was the norm. The oldest colleges for women in the United States evolved from private academies established for the daughters of the wealthy. This was the path followed by one of the best known of all women's colleges, Mount Holyoke in South Hadley, Massachusetts. Usually considered to be the very first American women's college, it evolved from a private girls academy, Mary Lyons Academy, established in 1837, although it was not chartered to grant college degrees until 1888. The process of expanding higher education for women grew at the same time as the women's rights movement began and was aided by the social and economic dislocations that resulted from the Civil War. The most famous American women's colleges date from these years. So we have Vassar in 1861, Wellesley 1870, Smith 1871, Radcliffe 1879, Bryn Mawr, 1885, and Barnard, 1889. Again, the so-called women's ivies. What these schools had in common was that they were small, single sex, expensive, and Protestant. Some historians have argued that even if a Catholic girl could afford to attend any of these institutions, she would most likely not have been admitted because of the prevailing anti-Catholic biases of the time. Those biases would remain throughout the 19th century, and they grew even more intense as the demographic and religious makeup of the country changed with the mass migration of European Catholics to the United States. Beginning with the famine Irish in the 1840s, successive waves of European Catholics, Germans, Poles, Slavs, and Italians came to America throughout the 1880s and 1890s and eventually demanded a place at the table. By the later decades of the 19th century, there was a sizable enough Catholic middle class that was both eager to seek higher education for their daughters and capable of paying for it. These numbers grew even larger by the early 20th century, 
as the children and grandchildren of Catholic immigrants also aspired to higher education. How would the Catholic Church respond to all of this? By 1890, the American Catholic Church sponsored more than 60 colleges for men, but not a single one for women. You know the names of the most celebrated Catholic schools. Georgetown, Notre Dame, Holy Cross, Seton Hall, St. Peter's. I hope I have not left out anyone's favorite. All from the very start were established for men only. No Catholic college on the national level admitted women unless it was to a specifically sex segregated and sexually stereotyped program. The Georgetown School of Nursing, which opened in 1903, was restricted to women only and remained an all female school even after the acceptance of women into Georgetown College in 1969. Prior to the 1950s, virtually every Catholic college in the country was a single sex institution. Why was this a problem? Because by 1890, more and more American women, including Catholics, were in fact choosing to attend college. Statistics from that year show more than 35,000 American women enrolled in college. By 1900, the number had grown to almost 48,000 an increase of 144%. Where would these determined Catholic women go if Catholic schools did not make room for them? These trends sparked a spirited debate among American bishops and other Catholic religious leaders. Many Catholic conservatives opposed higher education for women because they feared it might encourage them to seek professional careers that would threaten both traditional views of femininity as well as the Catholic home. Contemporary studies documented that the first generation of America's female college graduates were indeed overwhelmingly unmarried and even if married, had few or no children. Liberal Catholics, on the other hand, didn't want to give the impression that the church was against progress. Some, like Bishop John Spaulding of Peoria, Illinois, tackled the issue of sexist bias head on. If women seemed to lack capacity for work beyond the domestic, he argued, it was only because men had refused them entry into wider spheres of action. The sphere of woman was wherever she could live nobly and do useful work. Other Catholic leaders took a more pragmatic and expedient approach. Men such as Bernard McQuaid, the president of Seton Hall College and first Bishop of Rochester knew that if Catholics did not make provision for women to attend Catholic colleges, then these girls would go to secular schools. And that in and of itself posed serious dangers for their spiritual welfare. They would be forced to attend non-Catholic chapel exercises. They might hear heretical or radical ideas in the classroom. They might be exposed to sexual immorality in the residence hall, or even wind up marrying a non-Catholic spouse. The Catholic press was full of such stories. In 1897, Philadelphia Archbishop Patrick Ryan said he personally knew two young ladies who graduated at Radcliffe and lost their faith there. In 1907, New York Archbishop John Farley bemoaned the fate of a young woman who after attending a secular women's college for only six months, refused to attend church services with her family on Holy Thursday. The warnings were dramatic. In the words of one journalist, any Catholic parent who thus exposes his or her daughter to the loss of the precious gift of faith will be indirectly responsible if that daughter becomes an apostate from the religion of her fathers. Famed Irish Catholic writer, Catherine Tynan, provided a simple answer to all of this. The danger for women existed when Catholic students were isolated minorities on secular campuses with their Protestant perspectives and radical feminist ideas. 
flood them with Catholics, she wrote, and the danger is killed. Flood them with Catholics. The solution in a nutshell was that it would be in the best interest of the Catholic Church to establish separate colleges for Catholic women. And so this happened in a complex, complicated variety of ways. The first Catholic women's colleges followed a path similar to that of the older Protestant schools, evolving into colleges from what were called girls' academies or high schools. Such academies had been created by communities of Catholic sisters since the earliest years of our country's history. Schools like Ursuline Academy in New Orleans, established by the Sisters of Mercy in 1727, and Visitation Academy in Washington, DC, founded by the Visitation Sisters in 1799. By the end of the 1800s, there were 44,000 Catholic sisters in the United States who belonged to 118 separate religious orders. And these orders, among their numerous contributions to American life, took as one of their most important tasks, the education of girls, both rich and poor. And these sisters were smart cookies, as I said yesterday on the radio. The establishment of fee charging academies for the daughters of the wealthy gave these congregations the means to extend their ministries to services for the poor, orphanages, foundling homes, basic grammar schools. By 1890, the number of Catholic girls academies in the United States exceeded 600. These academies were the seedbed of many Catholic women's colleges. As the sponsoring congregations gradually and legally extended the curriculum of girls' academies to include college level study. Historians of American education explain that the labor and avail availability of Catholic sisters to found both academies and then colleges gave American Catholics an advantage in the institutionalization of higher education against which Protestants could never compete. This organic evolution from academy to college helps to explain why studying the topic of Catholic women's colleges is so complicated and so confusing. So please bear with me here. If we look only at the date of original inception as an academy, then the honor of being the first Catholic women's college goes to St. Mary of the Woods College established as an academy for Catholic immigrants by the Sisters of Providence in Indiana in 1840. As a college, however, St. Mary's of the Woods was not incorporated until 1928. If, however, we look at the date when women first received a baccalaureate degree from a Catholic institution, then credit for being the first truly Catholic College for Women goes to Notre Dame of Maryland. Its founders, the School Sisters of Notre Dame, operated several academies for girls in Baltimore. And in 1895, one of them received authorization to award college degrees. The fledgling girls college promised to, and I quote, meet the ever increasing demands to give women the opportunity for intellectual training as thorough and comprehensive as is afforded to men in the best colleges of the country. The six women in its first graduating class of 1899 were the first of their sex ever to receive a degree from an American Catholic college. Here in New Jersey, the Sisters of Charity established the Academy of St. Elizabeth in Madison in 1860 the oldest high school for girls in the state. By 1895, the sisters drafted plans for a four-year college curriculum. The baccalaureate program was approved in 1899, making the college, now University of St. Elizabeth, the only college for women in New Jersey and one of the first five Catholic women's colleges in the United States. It is interesting to point out how non-Catholics in New Jersey 
reacted to all of this. They argued that the state needed to create a public women's college precisely because New Jersey girls had no secular college to attend. This argument sparked the creation of the New Jersey College for Women in 1918, which was later renamed Douglas College after its founder, Mabel Smith Douglas, and is now part of Rutgers University. There are many examples of the trajectory I have just described, the evolution from girls' academy to college. What we today know as Georgian Court University in Lakewood evolved from Mount St. Mary's Academy, established by the Sisters of Mercy in Plainfield in 1908. Fontbonne University in St. Louis opened at, as St. Joseph's Academy for Girls in 1841 and was officially chartered as a college in 1923. Of course, we know that the Sisters of St. Dominic had a long and storied tradition of operating schools for girls in Jersey City since 1878, at, here um, on the camp, current campus of Caldwell University since 1892, and in Montclair since 1920. They did this all before opening Caldwell College for Women in 1939. In fact, during the 1920s, Mother Joseph Dunn deliberately planned a 1.25 million expansion at Mount St. Dominic Academy, erecting Rosary Hall, Aquinas Hall, and Albertus Magnus Hall with an eye toward opening a college in the future. The second type of Catholic women's college to emerge was one that was not preceded by a secondary school. Trinity College in Washington, DC, now Trinity Washington University, is usually considered to be the first and best representative of this type. Trinity College was founded by the Sisters of Notre Dame de Namur in 1897. According to Sister Julia McGroarty, McGroarty its founder, the goal of the college was to provide women with, and I quote, an education which will be equal, if not superior, to those of our best non-Catholic colleges. And to do this, she insisted, there needed to be a clear physical separation between high school and college. Trinity proudly claimed that its admissions requirements were identical to those of Radcliffe, Vassar, and Bryn Mawr. With the exception of mandated theology courses, the curriculum of schools like Trinity resembled that at these colleges. That is a classical curriculum that was not vocationally oriented. Although Trinity offered electives in education, for example, there was no major or even certificate program in education for decades. Colleges like Trinity were distinguished by the attention paid to exclusivity, academics, and geography. By the late 19th century, the affiliated or coordinated college model became attractive to the conservative trustees of elite male institutions who refused to bend on the subject of co-education. Radcliffe, for example, was informally known as Harvard Annex before being chartered formally as the Coordinate Women's College of Harvard in 1893. Barnard began as an affiliate of Columbia in 1889. Even Princeton had a short-lived experience with such modeling, sponsoring Evelyn College for Women for 10 years from 1887 to 1897. With its Washington DC location and proximity to the newly established Catholic University, as well as to Georgetown, Trinity might be viewed as a Catholic college of this affiliated or coordinated type. Another contender would be St. Mary's College in South Bend, Indiana. In 1844, Holy Cross Father Edward Soren requested that religious sisters be sent to the Indiana wilderness to possibly start a girls' school that would complement the newly founded all-male Notre Dame College. 
four brave Holy Cross sisters responded, making a 40 day journey from France to Northern Indiana. The school they founded in 1844 was named St. Mary's Academy and officially incorporated as a college in 1908. Perhaps the best surviving Catholic model of the affiliated or coordinated college is the association that continues to exist between St. John's University and the College of St. Benedict, both in Collegeville, Minnesota. St. John's University was founded in 1857 by Benedictine monks who migrated to frontier Minnesota from Germany. The monks of St. John's Abbey founded St. Benedict's Academy for Women in 1889. St. Benedict's began to offer a collegiate curriculum in 1913, but was not officially incorporated as the College of St. Benedict until 1961. Shortly thereafter, a unique institutional partnership began, whereby the two separate single sex institutions, St. John's and St. Benedict's, share a common academic program and facilitate co-educational classes on both campuses. This unique arrangement continues to this day. The last group of Catholic women's colleges to emerge was the largest and most diverse. These share characteristics with those I have already described, but also have some unique identifying features. They were established decades after the first formative years of female Catholic ed higher education. They were more local in reputation and name recognition. They served a socially broader constituency, including the daughters of the working and middle classes. They welcomed commuter students who could not afford to attend more expensive and selective residential schools. Most significant of all, they frankly acknowledged the need for some type of career preparation for women. Rejecting the perception that they were somehow girls finishing schools, they promised a balanced curriculum that integrated the liberal arts with a vocational orientation of some kind. Coming into existence in the 1920s and in the decades that followed, they recognized that their female graduates were entering an America whose workforce was no longer exclusively male. Women were well represented in the American labor force by this time, albeit in sex segregated fields like teaching, nursing, and secretarial work. The most important reason, however, for the proliferation of Catholic women's colleges after 1920 is one that is very little discussed. Changes in teacher education requirements as American public school education developed and matured. As states increasingly raised their standards for teacher preparation in the public sector, pressure grew on the growing network of Catholic schools to keep pace. Tightening standards in teacher preparation requirements were occurring in the opening two decades of the 20th century. At the same time that Catholic parochial education on both the elementary and secondary levels was dramatically increasing. The problem became even more worrisome as the baby boom of the 1940s and 1950s and the growing wealth of American Catholic families raised questions about the academic credentials of sisters who would be teaching young Catholic children in new suburban settings. This issue was discussed by American bishops as early as 1884 at the Council of Baltimore, the meeting which famously exhorted all Catholic parishes to make provision for the establishment of elementary schools. Understandably worried about the perceived quality of parochial schools, bishops directed the teaching sisterhoods within their dioceses to focus on teacher training programs and to find ways to educate their sisters properly. By the interwar years, the norm in many communities was the so-called 20-year plan by which a sister completed the first two years of college prior to entering the classroom 
and then pursued her bachelor's degree by means of summer study. The unfortunate result of this method was slow progress in college completion. Into the 1950s, a great many sister teachers still had less formal education than their public school counterparts. All of these demands severely impacted religious communities heavily invested in parochial school teaching. The nation's bishops, along with communities of religious sisters who reported to them, were confronted with several challenges. How to produce qualified teachers for an ever-expanding network of Catholic schools and how to do so in a timely fashion. How to educate young sisters and prepare them for teaching careers without interfering with their religious formation. And perhaps most important of all, how to finance the education of these young sisters. While a small number of sisters could be sent elsewhere for these purposes, to male Catholic colleges that set up special programs for them, to normal schools or to state-sponsored schools, this created a significant financial burden for most religious communities. The response of many religious communities, therefore, was to add the establishment of colleges to the portfolio, to their portfolio of activities. To put it simply, mother superiors opened colleges, both two and four year versions, as a cost effective means to provide teacher training to members of their own communities. Mother Joseph Dunn, the founder of Caldwell College for Women, was clearly motivated by these concerns. Serving as director of education for the Sisters of St. Dominic from 1915 to 1923, she knew that the education of sisters for ministry was a priority. When she became mother general of the sisters in 1927, she immediately began working to establish a college on Mount St. Dominic, a project she meticulously and patiently planned for 12 years. The immensely competitive spirit among religious sisterhoods also fueled the creation of colleges because each community was protective of its own history, traditions, and charism. Each felt the need to establish its own college, both to establish its own sisters, to, to educate its own sisters, sorry, and also as a vehicle to draw young women into its community. After the achievement of woman suffrage in 1920, American bishops also were anxious to appear supportive of women's educational aspirations. Many of us have heard the story of how the Sisters of St. Dominic finally earned Episcopal permission to establish Coldwell College, repeatedly denied permission for their new venture because of the existence of the College of St. Elizabeth, the Archdiocese of Newark finally granted permission only in 1939, when St. Elizabeth suddenly found itself within the geographic confines of the newly created Diocese of Patterson. At that point, Newark Archbishop Thomas J. Walsh, who saw himself as a great supporter of Catholic higher education for both men and women, felt his diocese was clearly deficient by not having a college for women within its boundaries. And so, because of that cute geographic fact, Caldwell College for Women was formally able to be established. The need to educate and properly credential Catholic religious sisters for teaching in parochial schools was one of the most important and little known factors behind the creation of Catholic women's colleges in the United States. Using New Jersey as an example, we see that the Sisters of Charity had established the College of St. Elizabeth by 1899. The Sisters of Mercy had established Mount St. Mary's, the forerunner of Georgian Court College by 1908. The Sisters of St. Dominic of Caldwell had established Caldwell College for Women by 1939. And the late comer to our story, the Felician Sisters formally established Felician College as a four-year degree granting institution in 1967 after its foundation as a two-year teacher training school, Immaculate Conception Normal School 
1923. Felician's story adds yet another dimension to this narrative. Communities of Catholic sisters at one time operated dozens of Catholic junior colleges. While most of these institutions welcomed all qualified women, some restricted enrollment to religious sisters only. These were called sister formation colleges. At one point in the 20th century, more than 70 such colleges existed. Today, only one remains in the entire United States. And interestingly enough, it is located right here in New Jersey. Assumption College for Sisters was established by the Sisters of Christian Charity in 1953 in a special arrangement with Seton Hall University and separately incorporated in 1961 as a two-year teacher training college for sisters. New Jersey once had 11 Catholic junior colleges, forgotten places like Alphonsus College, Tom Brock College, and Walsh College. By the 1970s, all but Assumption College had closed. With the creation of public community colleges and the expansion of state colleges, there was no longer a place or a market for the Catholic junior college model. Mother Joseph Dunn was very wise to reject the option of opening a two-year college, although it does appear to have at one time been under serious consideration for Caldwell. So to summarize all this, for more than 70 years, from the 1890s through the 1960s, Catholic women's colleges proliferated in America. By 1936, the number of Catholic women's colleges had outstripped the number of Protestant and non-sectarian colleges for women. By 1955, there were 140 two and four year Catholic women's colleges. By 1968, there were more than 170. This was their peak year when they collectively enrolled 101,000 students, about 1 70th of the 7.5 million students enrolled in American higher education at that time. Even as they grew, fears about the viability of these institutions were publicly expressed, even by Catholic educators. As early as 1918, at a meeting of the National Catholic Educational Association, Dean Mary Malloy of the College of St. Teresa in Winona, Minnesota, minced no words when she warned against the multiplication of colleges for women. We have too many small, struggling, inefficient, and useless so-called colleges, she lamented. Emphasizing the stark inefficiency of existing organizational models, she called for Catholic colleges for women that are not feeble replicas, one of the other. She suggested dividing the country into five geographical regions as a way to establish truly great Catholic institutions that could attract generous benefactors. Why not a Catholic teacher's college for women in each region of the country, a Catholic law school for women, a great Catholic medical college? Obviously her warnings were not heeded and none of this occurred. Over 200 women's colleges were founded by Catholic religious communities, but today many have closed their doors. Those that remain have morphed into very different kinds of places. Some merged with other institutions. Some shed their Catholic identity. Many embraced co-education. From 1968 to 1975, the height of second wave feminism, I remind you, the number of Catholic women's colleges eager to accept male students quadrupled. As we all know, Caldwell made that bold and successful move in 1986. Others were neither so quick to act nor as fortunate. Coeducation could not save one of the oldest Catholic women's colleges, the College of New Rochelle which closed its doors in 2019 after 115 years of operation. Mary Malloy's own institution, the College of St. Teresa, closed in 1989. 
The demise of the Catholic Women's College was a consequence of social and political changes in American society, as well as changes in the larger Catholic Church. Catholic Women's Colleges were a product of a time when women had limited options and opportunities in America, and the American Catholics, both lay and clerical, were more willing to embrace the concept of female difference. All that changed in the 1960s, when feminism rocked American society and the Catholic Church modernized itself in Vatican II. In a world of widening opportunities, fewer women sought independence and opportunity as members of religious communities. The old single sex model of education became an endangered species, perceived to be an unnecessary and unwarranted anachronism of another time as one after the other single sex male institutions moved to admit women. Many women's colleges, both secular and Catholic, closed their doors. Closest to home here in New Jersey is the story of the former Douglas College. Once the largest public women's college in the country, the women's branch of Rutgers University and the successor to the first public women's college in the state, the New Jersey College for Women, which I talked to you about earlier. Douglas, very interestingly enough, was the place where I began my teaching career. Douglas College no longer exists as a separate degree granting part of Rutgers University. Today, only about 33 active women's colleges remain in the United States. That number continues to fluctuate. Judson College, an all women's Baptist college in Alabama, originally founded in 1838, closed its doors last year. Mill Mills College, one of the oldest and fiercely feminist women's colleges in the country, recently announced its plans to close by 2023, a victim of the pandemic. So, as I always say to my students, now that you know all of this complicated chronology, you may very well ask, okay, so what? Who cares? What difference does all of this make? Rather than lament the passing of these institutions, we should instead celebrate their legacy, marvel at the adaptability of those that remain and acknowledge what these places contributed and continued to contribute to American life. Catholic women's colleges hold an unrecognized place in the history of higher education in the United States. David O'Brien in his book on Catholic higher education from the heart of the American church calls Catholic women's institutions invisible, even though the number of colleges founded by women religious eventually surpassed both non-Catholic women's colleges and Catholic men's colleges. How do we explain this neglect? Part of the answer certainly lies in the outsider status of Catholics throughout much of the history of the United States. Another is the stridently feminist nature of the discipline of women's history and the highly politicized focus of scholarship on women as this has evolved in the last 50 years. In the words of one observer, most Catholic history has been written by men who ignored women and most women's history has been written by people who were prejudiced against Catholics. The study of Catholic women's colleges reminds us once again of the unheralded role played by Catholic religious sisters in American life, history, and culture. There is a story of female initiative on a grand scale, a story that deserves to take its place alongside the more familiar ones of suffrage activists, politicians, abolitionists, and social reformers. Although they probably do not see themselves as such, the gentle giants behind the establishment of these colleges were dreamers and planners, businesswomen, CEOs, and entrepreneurs who planned, staffed, and built institutions not only in times of prosperity, but also in challenging times of depression and war. Think about the roots of Caldwell University. September 1939 was not exactly the most auspicious time to start a college. Oh, that's when World War II started, you know, just remind me. Right. Often at odds with local bishops, 
The sisters who founded these colleges were persistent in their demands and in their dreams. I like to call Catholic women's colleges the little engines that could in American higher education. Especially in the early decades, faculty were not always fully credentialed, operating funds were chronically short, and fundraising operations remained unsophisticated and insufficient for quite some time. These colleges had no endowment, save for the labor and intellect of the sisters who founded and taught in them. Tuition driven from their inception, they lacked many resources, save for the determination and hard work of the women who started, staffed, and supported them. Clearly aware of the obstacles they faced, they forged ahead. Writing to a fellow sister about the financial challenges of starting Trinity College, Sister Julia McGrorty was both firm and fearless. I have 70 years experience, she explained. I have erected three institutions with the assistance of my able sisters. Why should we fear to fail simply because one element of success is wanting? And notice she writes, she puts them in parentheses, the money, you know, that's, that seems to be not so important. We are considered by the outside world immensely wealthy because we manage our own affairs, have no man of business, have never asked anything of anyone. For the sake of this work, we must not fail. At Caldwell, Mother Joseph Dunn was often heard expressing similar sentiments. If God wants the college, God will bless the college, was her mantra. Inspired by this vision, her message to faculty and staff was always, do your best and forge ahead. In her history of the Sisters of St. Dominic of Caldwell, Sister Lois Curry characterized the first 10 years of Caldwell College as, and I quote, continuing the Dominican tradition of doing great things on a shoestring budget. Students were the beneficiaries. Thanks to the selfless labor of Catholic sisters, the tuition at Catholic women's colleges was always lower than that at their Protestant and independent counterparts. A certain adaptability, creativity, and ingenuity resulted from always having to accomplish tasks with fewer resources. As Rutgers archivist Fernanda Perone has documented, even those Catholic women's colleges that subsequently closed their doors made path-breaking contributions to American higher education. Many of these colleges pioneered experimental curricula that became models for other institutions. Loretto Heights College in Denver, Colorado introduced an innovative baccalaureate program in nursing in the early 1950s a time when most nursing programs were still based in hospitals. Mundelein College in Chicago inaugurated a residential weekend college for non-traditional students in 1974, the first of its kind in the country and one that was copied by many other institutions. Catholic women's colleges were also leaders in establishing programs for underserved populations. In the 1980s, nursing students from Nazareth College in Kalamazoo, Michigan, served as school nurses in inner city districts that could not afford to hire graduate nurses. Fort Wright College in Spokane, Washington provided extension courses for Native American women in the Yakima Valley. When the college closed in 1982, this outreach program was taken over and expanded by its successor institution, Heritage University. Such pioneering creativity continues today. One of the most novel ventures I have recently heard of involves Mount Mary University in Milwaukee, founded by the school sisters of Notre Dame in 1913. In 2020, they announced plans to build new intergenerational campus housing, welcoming both single mothers and retired sisters in a shared residential community. The project is seen as a way to integrate the sisters into the life of the college while at the same time supporting the needs of single parents who are enrolled as students. Catholic colleges founded and sponsored by women religious have been historically committed to women's education. And this is a distinctive feature of their Catholic identity. Had it not been for the numerous congregations of women religious founding, funding, leading and staffing Catholic women's colleges throughout the United States, the women they served may have not had access to a college education. 
by providing opportunities for working class minority and older students to attend private colleges, Catholic women's colleges contributed to the democratization of higher education in America. Understanding this aspect of Catholic higher education causes us to rethink what is meant by the very concept of American feminism. Feminism is a very problematic word. It confuses as much as it enlightens. The word was first used by a French socialist in the early 19th century and didn't enter the English language until the early 20th. Reporting on a feminist lecture series held in New York City in 1913, the New York Times concluded that this new ideology was something with dynamite in it. With its socialist, anti-family and anti-religious roots, few women who attended Catholic women's colleges would probably have identified themselves as feminists. So the question of whether or not Catholic women's colleges embodied feminist ideals is a meaningless one. Catholic women's colleges were in the business of educating women to do useful work, however that work came to be defined. A review of the catalogs and course offerings of Catholic women's colleges in their early years demonstrates that only a handful could truly be called liberal arts colleges in the purest sense. From the first, preparation of students for careers was at the heart of their mission whether their students were religious sisters preparing for teaching roles in the parochial schools or the daughters of working class parents who wanted to be sure their financial investment in their daughter's education was a sound one. In explaining their mission, Catholic educators were both blunt and realistic. Women needed to be educated because even the most talented student should have some practical profession upon which she can fall back in case of need. The College of St. Elizabeth emphasized that its rigorous academic curriculum would prepare women to enter the service professions. The first catalog of Georgian Court College spoke of its well-balanced education that prepared women for vocational fields adopted to their special talents. In founding Caldwell College, Mother Joseph described it as a place where the sisters, as well as women from middle-class family backgrounds, could procure a broad-based liberal arts education in a Catholic cultural envi environment. Caldwell College's founding documents outlined a variety of goals, including providing students with the means of earning a living and preparing them for a profession. The final draft of the college's constitution, completed in August 1945, promised that the college would give young women a college education that would have both a cultural and practical background. It would train them to be, quote, womanly and all that term connotes, whether they be found as homemakers, professional or business women. A former president of Trinity College in Washington put it very well. We are not in the business of training committee women or bridge players. The College of New Rochelle called it education for service. Chestnut Hill College rephrased it as service to the dear neighbor. The need to preserve a balance between the liberal arts and career preparation was repeatedly emphasized in founding documents. Vocational programs were described as being, quote, carefully selected. For decades, the most pro popular programs were education, social service, journalism, or something called social business. I don't know what that means. For 12 years, between 1952 and 1964, Caldwell offered an AA degree in secretarial science. Others offered home economics, domestic economy, dietetics, nutrition, medical technology, or library science. Historians have emphasized the critical role played by religious sisters and Catholic women's colleges to the field of nursing education in the United States. The Sisters of Mercy are especially noteworthy in this regard. As of 1960, they administered 121 hospitals and 16 liberal arts colleges in the United States, five of which developed some of the oldest baccalaureate nursing programs in the country. So did Catholic women's colleges believe in women's liberation? 
Speaking at her own installation as president of Caldwell College in 1970, Sister Anne John O'Laughlin brilliantly redefined the issue. Catholic women's colleges were dedicated, she wrote and spoke, to the liberation of the minds of women. And she challenged what higher form of liberation could there be? Pioneering Catholic women's colleges encouraged high standards of academic achievement and attainment from the start. Their sister faculty earned advanced graduate degrees at rates that greatly exceeded those of other women, both in the United States and Europe. Often the planning to properly credential faculty began years before the colleges officially began operating. Although St. Catherine's College in St. Paul did not open until 1905, Sisters of St. Joseph sought advanced degrees from Oxford, the University of Chicago, and the University of Minnesota as far back as the 1880s. Within two decades of college founding, sisters with doctorates were teaching courses in most academic disciplines at Notre Dame of Maryland, Trinity, St. Mary's, St. Catharines, St. Elizabeth's, St. Teresa's, and the other pioneer college. When it opened in 1939, Caldwell had several sisters with PhDs among its small faculty. The first American woman to obtain a PhD in computer science was a Catholic religious sister. Sister Mary Kenneth Keller, a member of the Sisters of Charity of the Blessed Virgin Mary. After earning her doctorate at the University of Wisconsin in 1965, she founded the computer science department at Clark College in Dubuque, Iowa, the Catholic Women's College founded by her order. The sisters' own pursuit of higher education broke glass ceilings. From the very first, they were role models to their female students, even before that term existed. If you went to Trinity College in 1900 or Caldwell College in 1950 and were taught by sisters who had doctorates, maybe you think, I could do that too. Evidence bears this out. Between 1936 and 1950, Washington's Trinity College produced more PhD candidates in the humanities and the social science than any other institution of its kind in the country. In 1937, the College of St. Catherine became the first Catholic college, male or female, to have a chapter of Phi Beta Kappa, the oldest and most prestigious academic honor society in the United States. It was through the leadership of women religious that lay men and women first gained access to theological studies in the United States. Through the early 1940s, only men training for the priesthood were allowed to study and earn advanced degrees in theology. Because women religion were, religious were excluded from this field, they had to rely on priests to teach religious religion courses in the women's colleges they founded. When Caldwell College opened in 1939, the faculty included two priests specifically appointed by the Archdiocese of Newark to teach theology. This began to change thanks to the work of Sister Madleva Wolf, president of St. Mary's College in South Bend, and herself the, the holder of a PhD in medieval literature from Cal Berkeley. In 1943, she opened the first school of sacred theology that admitted both women religious and the laity. Before she set up this program at St. Mary's, there was no graduate school in the United States where women could earn an advanced degree in Catholic theology. Sister Madleva's vision produced some of the first female theologians in the United States, including Caldwell's own sister, Maura Campbell, who earned her PhD at St. Mary's in 1955 and taught theology and philosophy here for decades. Despite the changes and transformations many have undergone, the greatest legacy of Catholic women's colleges has been their role in helping marginalized groups gain access to higher education. Perhaps the most important but least known aspect of this history involves the work of the Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament. Philadelphia heiress Catherine Drexel founded this group in 1891 
specifically to work among African Americans and the indigenous people of the American West. In 1915, the Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament opened a high school for African Americans in New Orleans. In 1917, this became a normal or teacher training school, preparing African Americans for teaching careers, one of the few professional careers open to them at this time. These ventures laid the groundwork for Xavier University, founded in 1925 as the only historically black and Catholic institution in the country. Xavier has been unique on many levels. It was the first coeducational college to be established by women religion, religious, and it was also the first college founded by women religious to become a university. Today, it remains a dynamic leader in the professional education of African-American students. Known for its stellar record for placing African-Americans into medical school, Xavier is said to have educated more than 80% of the African-American physicians in the United States. Its College of Pharmacy is also among the nation's top producers of African-American pharmacists. Xavier University is also home to the Institute for Black Catholic Studies, created in 1979 to offer programs and support research opportunities to understand Black cultural values and celebrate Black contributions to Catholicism in America. While Xavier University has never veered from its original mission, one of the nation's oldest Catholic women's college, Trinity College in Washington, D.C., has reinterpreted its mission for a new age and a new century. Traditionally, Trinity had long been considered to be in a class by itself, among the oldest and most elite of all Catholic women's colleges, educating the daughters of wealthy Catholic families from all over the country and enjoying a national as opposed to merely regional or local reputation. Its prominent alumni include House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, former director of US Health and Human Services Kathleen Sebelius, and former Trump advisor Kellyanne Conway. Today, Trinity's 2,000 students are overwhelmingly women of color, non-Catholic, very low income, and often the first in their families to go to college. 10% are dreamers, immigrants brought to this country as children by families who entered without legal documents. So in conclusion, for over 2,000 years, since the days of the Roman Empire, Catholic men and women all over the world have worked to meet the needs of the age. Today, I'd like to believe that this work is more important than ever. Philip Gleason, who is the best historian of Catholic thought in America, has argued that as we look back at American Catholic history, we see that the great cataclysms of the 20th century sparked periods of great renewal in the Catholic Church because they fueled the belief that modern secular society has exhausted itself. Indeed, the years of greatest growth in the number of colleges founded by women religious was precisely in such times, the years after World War I through the 1960s. In the famous words of F. Scott Fitzgerald, these were years when a new generation was growing up, a generation finding all gods dead, all wars fought, all faith in man shaken. Today, we are teaching a very similar generation who find themselves in a similar crisis of confidence. This generation has been described in a variety of ways. They have been called, oh, sorry about that one. What am I doing here? Oh, going backwards, that's terrible here. Okay, this generation has been described in a variety of ways. They have been called the unchurched generation or the nuns, those who come to us hungry for spirituality, but alarmingly bereft of formal religious training of any kind. Others recognize them as a shockingly lonely generation who don't trust the institutions that once helped young people navigate questions of identity, community, and meaning. In 2020, a national study completed by the Springtide Research Institute revealed that one third of 13 to 25 year olds had no trusted adults in their lives. Catholic institutions are uniquely positioned to have a positive influence on the lives of these young people, searching as they are for truth, authentic relationships, and caring mentors and role models who can show them that their lives do indeed have meaning and purpose. 
In preparing this talk, I came across a beautiful article written in 1941 by Sister Raymond Sanford, the first dean of Caldwell College. In it, she explained in detail what we mean when we say we are educating the whole person, physical, intellectual, and moral. She explained that above all, it was our task to instill reverence in our students. Reverence for God and his commands, reverence for the truth, reverence for authority, reverence for our fellow human beings, reverence for their rights, reverence for their relationship with others. Reverence, it is a very old fashioned word that perhaps needs to re-enter our vocabulary. Sister Ann John, whose inauguration speech I quoted earlier, gave an early, even more timely definition of the purpose of Catholic education. She explained that Catholic higher education seeks to liberate students, quote, from ignorance, from superstition, from mass hypnosis, mass hysteria, from misconceptions, from stereotyping, from confinement in thought, from pre-digested ideas, from the fear of being different and from the fear of probing the unknown. Although she was speaking in 1970, her words continued to make sense in a bitterly divided, confused, and conflicted America. Catholic women's colleges may have evolved at a different time and been started for a variety of reasons, but the needs they have aimed to meet seem to me to be more critical than ever. They have demonstrated a remarkable ability to adapt, to change, to survive, and indeed to thrive. May this continue. Thank you very much. So I apologize it was so long, but it's impossible to do the topic justice in a shorter span of time. So I don't know if anybody has any questions. I hope I can answer your questions if you do. Yes, Kathleen. So Kathleen went to the school in Milwaukee, Wisconsin that I was telling you about that is having the intergenerational dorm constructed. No. <laughs> Now, oh, I'm not, I'm not used to dealing with these things. Um, there are a couple of books on the work of Catholic sisters. There, as, there is one anthology on Catholic women's colleges. Um, it's okay, it's got 10 chapters and you know I don't need to know about all the clubs that existed at Catholic women's college. Uh, chapters of other books couple of articles. The woman I mentioned before, who is an archivist at Rutgers, has written a couple of uh, articles on Catholic women's colleges and junior colleges in New Jersey. But no. and, and you know, the reason for that is Catholic religious sisters have been very humble and they have not written about their work. They have not written about their contributions. They are only getting their archives in order in recent years. Um, Sister Elaine, God bless her, helped me get some photographs for this talk. I said, please, are you coming to my talk? And she said, oh, I'm at an archivist conference on the, those days, so she can't be here. So the basic answer to your question is no. I mean, some press reports you can find, some, uh, the, the um, Notre Dame of Maryland, which actually is the truly the oldest women's college in the United States, a book has just come out only about the, the College of Notre Dame of Maryland, Pursuing Truth, I believe is the title of that book that has just come out. But other than that, that's what we really need to happen. We need the history of these institutions to be written. And I have to tell you something else that really, really bothers me. And it hurt me in, in putting this talk together in a analytical and succinct way. What happens in some of these articles is that, and there, as I said, there's a book, one book with these 10, is that these writers start sniping at each other. Well, these were the elite colleges and these were not the elite colleges. These were the crummy ones that Mary Malloy wanted to close down. So you get a lot of that. And that was rather disturbing, you know? So Trinity deserves to survive because it was 
the oldest, one of the oldest and, you know, so elite and didn't evolve from a girls academy, but some of these others, eh, well, they can go by the wayside. So the answer to your question, long-winded answer, Kathleen, is no, not a lot. Yes. Yeah. Okay, one of the first. Now, again, uh, I was in contact with the sisters, of course, Sister Kathleen, I was in contact with them over the summer. And, you know, mythology and legend had it that she might have been one of the very first female theologians in the United States. I, I, I don't doubt that. I don't mean to disparage Sister Mora. I mean, many of you may know I named my only daughter after Sister Mora. So I am not disparaging Sister Mora. But that School of Sacred Theology was established in 1943. And Sister Mora got her doctorate in 1955. So I doubt that in that 12 year period, she was the first. She may have been, a, certainly she was an early, one of the early women in the United States to receive a doctorate, but I really don't think she was one of the very first, just because of the span of years. And I think you helped me with that too, Colette. Didn't we talk about that in the summer? Well, I know that uh, Sister uh, Nora. Nora, we, yeah, I was in contact with her too. Yeah, we had a lot, a lot of fun over the summer researching this. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Yes, Billy. Where do you see this class of education going, especially if the number of sisters, women religious, are declining? And they indeed are. And also, do you see any difference between schools in which the sisters are more visible? Assimilationist versus uh, isolationist, if that's proper. But what do you mean? Do you mean present and visible and active? And those ones who become part of society, whether it's those who want to be separate from society. I mean, is there such a trend? Is there such a pattern? Well, I don't quite understand that second part of the question. What I do know, and maybe Sister Kathleen can help us out here, is that surprisingly, the orders the religious communities that appear to be growing are those that are very traditional and isolationist communities of cloistered women. They are seeing an increase in the number of women who are joining those, those communities. But I could not answer, I, I would have no way of knowing uh, how colleges are doing if the sisters are more visibly present on campus than not visibly present. I, I, I have no way of answering that question. But the first part of your question is, where do we see this all going? Well, where I see it going is what we're doing exactly here at Caldwell. We try to keep the legacy of the sisters alive, right? And we need other people to step up to the plate. And I'm sorry to say, and I'm going to get myself in trouble, but I really don't care. You know, um, we need Catholic faculty. We need to make sure that we have a critical mass of Catholic faculty. And I know you can't ask that question, but I think it is extremely important. That is how we keep alive. And you know, in all honesty, I teach these two Catholic history courses. I love teaching these courses. I've only been teaching one for about five years and one for three years. And I am capable of teaching these courses. I don't think anybody is gonna call me a heretic or anything because I know my Catholic theology. You know, so I'm able to step up to the plate. I mean, obviously everybody can't do that, but that's what we need. And that's really what Caldwell has been trying to do from the Sisters Project a few years back and the Heritage Wall and bringing Sisters of St. Dominic here to campus. I mean, if the reality is that young women are not joining communities of religious sisters, then you, you have to do everything that you possibly can to not allow people to forget this work, you know? And as a historian, that's my job. My job is memory, historical memory. I mean, you're gonna be shocked. These kids get younger every year and I get older every year. So I think, oh, everybody remembers John Kennedy and everybody knows where they were when John Kennedy died. These kids don't even know who John Kennedy was. Oh yeah, I guess he was a president, you know? It's unbelievable. So all of these things, you know? They're gonna die out unless we make sure that our kids know their history. And I know that's a very controversial topic, all right? But they, they, have to know, they have to know their history and they have to know all kinds of history. And here at Coldwell, they need to know 
the history of the sisters who founded this institution, because if we don't do that, then we're no better than anybody else. We're no better than any other place. We're no different. And if we're not different, then why should we survive? Why should we exist? Yes. And our concern, when I heard you bring up the issue about the nuns, um, uh, this generation. The N O N E S, yeah. Yeah. My, my concern is that the value that I got as a young woman growing up were so, uh, that foundation that the sisters and the other teachers gave me were so important in my life. I, I cannot tell you how I've fallen back on these deep foundations over and over and over again. And I'm in my 70s now, and I so appreciate everything that they gave to me. And my fear is that this generation is missing out on that. It might be, you know, the value of the Christian values that I grew up with, but I also think it's the history. And the kids nowadays are really lacking in that. And, and so their lives are going to be all the mm -hmm. less, um, you know, more gloomy for it. Well, they have, they have no memory. Right. They have no cultural you know, perspective. It's up to the teachers and the, mm -hmm. and the uh, professors here on campus to hone in on that and really bang at it. I, that's my hope for this place anyway, because... You know, the country that we're in right now is, is a tough place to be. And, and I think you are the ones that can yeah. keep that spark going. Ryan, what, what do you say? Do I bang you over the head with what you need to know? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> just like, like what I want to do, um, even though we do not have one of the faculty, we're all like not sisters anymore, but sister presence around on campus has really have been rich in my life. Uh, still, you know, with Sister Joanne, and all the other sisters, um, they still impact our lives. I've seen their kindness and just their um, willingness to share their love of um, Catholicism with God to us uh, is very, very, very Good, and now you have to pass that on to the next one. <laughs> well, I don't want you to be pessimistic, so I'm going to tell you some, some good stories, all right? I teach these two courses in Catholic history, History of the Catholic Church, History of Catholics in America. They are very popular, right? So I always have to sign people in. We don't have a classroom big enough. So right now, History of Catholics in America, I have 33. They're not Catholic. They're, they're, I, I never ask them, are you Catholic? But I try to make them comfortable that it doesn't make any difference if they're Catholic. I try to explain to them why they're taking this course. I, I encourage them to share with me you know, their own faith experiences. And I don't have any hostility. I have to tell you, they really like this course. It's a really popular course. And I don't get any sense that they think, oh, you know, I hate this course. Why do I have to take this course? Because I make it very clear to them. You're not memorizing. You're not me me memorizing the catechism. I really don't have structured exams as such. We have a lot of fun projects. I make them all visit a Catholic church. And you should really read some of those papers because I have a series of things that they have to find. And what they write is absolutely beautiful for the most part. They say how comforting it is, how peaceful it is. They had never been in a Catholic church before or they had stopped going or they made baptism and Holy Communion but they hadn't been in the church in a long time. And I tell you the stuff they write I'm able to talk to my grandfather. It brought back great memories. I'm going to start going to church again. I had this one woman who was clearly not Catholic and she clearly did not like history. Okay. I don't know if she liked me, but I, we survived. Okay. Her final exam, I'll never forget it. She wrote in her final exam, I am not a religious person. I was not raised in a religious family, but after taking your course, I am sure that I want to raise my own children in a religious environment. I don't know what that religion is going to be, but I want them to have religion in their lives. 
So, you know, I can only speak anecdotally from my own experience, but we're trying, you know, we're, we're really trying. And plus I have a big mouth and I tell them what I think. <laughs> I don't care anymore. Fire me guys, fire me, I don't care. Well, thank you to all of you for your attention. Thank you.